Um, okay. So did, uh, Wendy, did you get a chance to continue on, on your training that you were working on before? Maybe with a couple bug fixes that, that we, we sent for you? Uh, yeah, so um, I, so kind of what I was working on is that uh, AWS had a drop repurposing knowledge graph, um, which uh, I kind of downloaded their triples and try training Python on it. And um, so what I did was, well, I think, so um, because it's quite a big graph, so the training, um, even one epoch takes, um, quite a while, so I haven't trained it for very many epochs. Um, so kind of what I was trying to do is to kind of, um, so I trained it for a couple of epochs and then tried doing what they did in terms of, so what, so they have an example where they use a different graph library and uh, they were looking at um, the kind of like which, which are the triples of um, drug, drug to uh, SARS um, relation that has like the best scores and um, kind of whether they are in clinical trials. So they, um, so kind of, I'm just trying to replicate the experiment and it sort of worked. So kind of they got a few that are in clinical trials for SARS now that the, their, um, their trained graph picked up and um, my PyChain graph that I trained for about five epochs managed to pick up one of them, um, which is okay. I mean, kind of, it's probably going to be better if I train it for more longer, but I haven't got around to doing that again. So um, I was about to try and train it for longer, but I was trying to figure out how to um, checkpoint the model at different stages, and I, I kind of like checkpoint the model, but I haven't figured that one out yet, so. Oh, well, I'll save you a little bit of time. We don't have any checkpointing features implemented. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, God, we never even considered doing that sort of thing, but I, I know it's something that people care about and want to use. Um, well, there is this continue training feature on the training loop, but it's that's the thing I've been having some issues with. I get it, it works sometimes, but not others. Yeah. So I have, I have been able to train and then stop and then keep training um, before, but it, with some models and some data, it doesn't work. So I've been trying to figure that out. <laughs> We've never really had a scenario that we were using to do that. And I'm trying to remember when we implemented this continued training, um, I don't want to call it a feature. It's, it's sort of hiding within the deeper interface. Mm. Uh, I don't even remember why we implemented that. There was a reason and it was very tricky and interesting. And I, mm. so uh, yeah, part of the reason, part of the reason is I was, it's, I was having trouble getting this, the stopper to work. And I actually, that's, that's sort of what I wanted to ask some questions about, but I, I don't want to interrupt. So. Yeah. yeah. So the stopper actually will provide some of the things that you might want to do with, um, with checkpointing because mm. Um, yeah, so with the early stopper, the idea is that you, you have a, a third set. It isn't the training or the testing set. And this third set sort of independent. And as you're training, you're evaluating a couple times. And you want to see that the evaluation is improving. And when the evaluation stops improving, there's no sense in training anymore. Um, sorry, I, I miss, I used the wrong words. This is the validation set. And when the evaluation on the validation set isn't improving, you stop training because there's no nothing more to learn. You'll, you'll just overfit. Um, the metrics that are calculated during the early stopper are, are saved. And then they, they kind of come through to the end with this results uh, object. But maybe Wendy, you can explain like what, what you would want to use the checkpoint for, but just to make comparison of the results um, kind of in an uh, ad hoc way. Yeah, I guess my thinking and checkpointing is because um kind of i'd like to keep track of the intermediate results just in case it crash because um like because i'm running it on my own machine and if i forgot what uh, about that i'm running it in the background turn it off at night i would be able to resume 
it, and not have to start from the beginning. So, um, which is what I was thinking about looking up whether I can do it or not. Um, and then also, yeah, so, so kind of rather, and also kind of, I'm obviously there is the early stopping feature. Um, but uh, I guess because I'm not completely sure what I'm doing, I thought it might be useful to be able to save a few intermediate results just in case. So it's kind of compare them. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe John can explain what he was having a problem with in the early stopper and it might be useful for you too. So, um, so I started out running uh, some, trying to like go to bigger and bigger networks running on my local machine on Jupyter Notebook. And what I found was that the training could happen pretty quickly. And then uh, um, well, let, let me back, let me back up a little bit. Um, so uh, when I was sort of first messing around, I realized that like there's this step after training where it goes to evaluation and then it does this process of trying to optimize the batch size for the evaluation. Yeah, this sort right? of quickly in the beginning. Well, not so quickly necessarily, depending on yeah, how. Yeah, actually, so for the, for the senior network, which is about 30,000 edges, it would that took like 40 minutes or something like that. And the training actually was done within five. Um, That's because you did a really good job optimizing your parameters. The question- No, well, no, no, well, no. <laughs> what's that? But they're diminishing returns. I mean, maybe maybe it takes longer to optimize the parameters than to just start- No, this was, this was just a single run. I mean, there was no optimizing the parameters at all. So not the parameters, but the batch size. This, this memory. Yeah, well, so then I, I, I sort of, then I tried to turn off the batch size optimization and, um, and and I like looked in the code at the various flags and you can set like model dot automatic, you know, memory optimization or something to false. And there's a few other things that you can do to prevent that from happening. You can explicitly set a batch size and all that. And I was able to prevent it from doing that during training. Um, but, and I think that might've stopped it for the evaluation. I can't remember. I'm getting a few things mixed up, I'm afraid. But well, the, the thing that I did notice is uh, if I used a stopper, it always jumped to doing this um, this optimization. Even if I provided a batch size, even if I set automatic memory optimization to false, and so it would go through, and then it would um, do one epoch, and then sit there waiting for this to run. And this is this is running on a CPU for a for a network that was pretty large, um, and it just like I would lose patience, and I would. Then I would just like kill the stopper. Like I'll do this without the stopper because I can train it. You know, hundreds of you know, you know, I can train it pretty fast if I just like let it run and then like check on it. And then maybe if it's not good enough, I can continue training. And then um, and that actually worked sometimes. So I could like train for a hundred epochs, check things out, look at the losses curve, and be like, okay, well it hasn't flattened out yet. I'll train for another hundred epochs or something like that. Yeah, but you, you know, the, that's a little bit of of a fallacy is, is the losses curve. It's good to know that it's going down. So it's something's mm. happening, but yeah. you should be evaluating and deciding if you're done based on, on the evaluation. So, well, that, the other thing was, is that I was the, in my use case, I didn't even have a test set because my, what I was, what I was curious to do was train on the full data set, everything in senior. So basically only biological databases. Mm -hmm. And then um, use that as a way of, as a kind of a prior to score output from machine reading. Like this idea of how likely is this edge from machine reading and is that predictive of a reading error if it's highly unlikely. So as you can imagine, if like there's a grounding error in an extraction, the, you now might be have two nodes that would be very unlikely to be connected because it's just a misinterpretation of one of the named entities or something like that. So that should be a low probability edge. But in order for that to work, I wanted to train it on the full data set. But then I had to like shoehorn things so that I had no evaluation set because everything is set up to like have an evaluation set. Now granted, I get that like, even in this case where you want to uh, use the whole data set, you probably should run many initial optimization rounds with an evaluation set to, under to understand if you 
are you know using good hyperparameters, right? Which is something that I like. I wanted to skip all that just as a proof of concept to sort of see if this would make any sense at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's so like that's why I'm trying to like I've been using not using pipeline. I've been using the stuff from beyond the pipeline so that I can set the <laughs> test. I can set training and test to the same thing, the mm -hmm. same set of the same triples factory, the same triples and all that stuff. So. Uh, that was one thing. And then, and then um, another thing that I ran into, so then I switched over to Google Colab for a couple of days and, you know, use the free GPUs there. And it's like insanely, it's like a hundred times faster, at least it's just many orders of magnitude faster. And rather than 40 minutes, it was like one minute or. Even well, even there, even there, the back size optimization like took really a really long time. Hmm. And, uh, and, um, I tried using the stopper there. I, I, I'd have to mess around with it some more. Part of the issue is that like, um, let, me, let me see if I can remember this. Um, uh, yeah, I would train for a while and then, so that the whole continue training thing was working in the Jupyter Notebook, but then it, with, with another data set, a much larger data set, this is now a data set of like almost 700,000 edges. This is all of the curated databases edges that we have. So like pathway common, senior, you know, all this stuff. Because it was basically this idea, like, can I, can I look at link prediction from all these things and look at, you know, scoring triples and stuff like that. So I took everything that we had and that, that trains, you can train like 500 epochs in on that whole network in like maybe 20 minutes or something like that. It's like pretty fast on the, on the GPU that you get in Google Colab. But then I couldn't continue training. Whereas that had worked before with this other data set, I would get this error that said, um, you know, can't continue training until it's been trained once. And I looked in the code and that's because it's looking into the optimizer and there's something called like self.optimizer.state. And if that's not set to something, it thinks it hasn't been trained. So I don't know, that's, that's probably in the weeds of how that optimizer object decides when there's some state that's set. I, I, I figured it would work if you trained like one epoch, there would be the optimizer state, but anyway, so that, so that, was, that was the other thing that I ran into. Then I messed around with the stopper and I couldn't get the stopper to work. Um, so anyway, I was, gonna, I was gonna ping you for, for, <laughs> for advice because I clearly, I don't think I'm, I'm doing this wrong. The other thing that I ran into was I couldn't save the model uh because i wanted to do result dot save to directory like that kind of thing mm -hmm. which worked but then when i was not using the pipeline when i was beyond the pipeline you need there's no result up. object so you then i tried to, to pickle it i tried to pickle it in the google collab and it immediately like killed the ram and try crashed the runtime <laughs> <laughs> you know what though so, it's probably yeah. just it's totally huge 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 model and yeah save it it saves everything inside it like the yeah our training data set is part of the model that gets saved together oh wow okay in, yeah in addition to all of, i mean that's tiny compared to the size of the embeddings and, mm -hmm. and uh, which model were you using like rotate probably, rotate yeah this is the, i think everyone should just be using rotate these days this is the one that's <laughs> the best. yeah however yeah. Um, the, the smart data analytics group just published a new model, which kind of takes this idea of rotate and goes a little more mm. generalized and mm. it may become the new model that we start telling people to use. I don't know. Interesting. Well, you can benchmark it now, right? You can put it in your suite of benchmarks. Well, I told Medi, I said, Hey, if your group is publishing new models, why don't you have these guys put a pull request into PyKeen? Like, cause you're in the same group. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. Totally. Um, um, so, but anyway, so, yeah, so I've been like using and abusing a few things. I mean, it, under the hood, I, what I saw is that it basically just calls torch.save on some version, yeah. some, something inside the model, but I was going to like, see if I could mess around with that, but I hadn't done that yet. Then I realized I was like, why can't I use the, res I could probably use, I looked back at my code and I was like, I should be able to use pipeline with this. I could just provide the same triples factory to, to training and testing. And that, I think they gave me an error. I got some kind of error with that. I couldn't remember. So then I said I couldn't do that. <laughs> so, well, yeah. You should be able to. Like, maybe you shouldn't, but, like, it's possible. Mm. Um, yeah. Th there are times where if you don't specify the testing set, it will just use the training set again for evaluation. This gives mm -hmm. you this internal error. But normally, mm -hmm. in machine learning, you're looking at this external error because you want to be able to say something about how your model could generalize. But since this isn't really right. this case, maybe that's okay. 
The other, the other weird thing is that I was like, oh, great. Now that I'm running this on GPUs, uh, it'll be fast enough to actually evaluate the batch size and, and I can like let it run that out. And then, and for whatever reason, I, so I set like, you know, auto, auto, op, automatically automa auto optimization or whatever to true. And then I ran it out and then it used a really small batch size that took like five times as long per epoch for some reason. So I, I couldn't figure that out. So one um, of the, this could happen, the, the batch yeah. size will be chosen based on your, your hyperparameters. So one of the things mm -hmm. you might want to do is choose a smaller embedding size. This will make it a lot. Oh, yeah, I mean, I haven't been changing any of the hyperparameters. I've just been using all the defaults, basically. I think the default probably 50. Um, uh, default was, what was I saying? Yeah, I didn't even specify. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, whatever the default is. So you can, you can turn down the size. You know, the thing is um, GPUs tend to have a smaller amount of memory than normal computers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Memory is mm -hmm. very um, sacred and, and uh, hard to get. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one reason why the batch size may be smaller on GPU versus training mm -hmm. on your laptop, which may be happier to have, you know, you might have. Well, no, that, was the weird, that was the weird thing. It was when I used my explicit script, the batch size ended up one thing. It was really, and it ended up being really big and fast. It was either did everything all the data in one batch or, may, or, or once it was two. Um, but then when I went back to pipeline, it broke it up into much smaller batches and like there were like, it had to go through a thousand different batches or something like that. It was batches of like 2000 uh, huh. uh, triples at a time. But I, I think I'm just totally doing this wrong. So I feel like I need to like, well, you know, I don't know if, if now is the time to get into like, uh, get into debugging, but. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in theory, if, if you have this high level interface and it's supposed to automatically pick the best one, it should, mm -hmm. should do a better job. But mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't give you advice on that because this is like some black magic stuff that Lauren implemented and you really have to get in touch with him. And I think the best ways I'm going to tell you again is just to put an issue onto the, the project. Right. GitHub. Yeah, well, I need to actually like be <laughs> disciplined enough to like try to re reproduce these issues. The thing is, it's like, one thing doesn't work, I just try another thing, and then I just try another thing, and then I just try another thing, right? So I don't have a yeah. sense of, I, I change multiple things at once and all that kind of stuff and change the data and everything, so. Well, um, human is definitely not science, so. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but well, it's pretty cool, for, yeah, oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Um, so kind of like the early stopper issue that you mm. found, I kind of ran into that as well, sort of because I did try adding in the early stopper to my uh, training script, but it just got stuck after Epoch 1 on the optimizing, and I gave up waiting for it. Yes. Huh. But that's really strange. Um, I don't know why that's happening, because we, we've also, I mean, we've used the early stopper um, in, in our, our benchmarking, where we did even bigger data sets, you know, ones that had in the, in the scale of hundreds of millions of edges. And that seemed to work. And we ran it on, on quite big GPUs, probably a lot bigger than the ones that Google is giving to people for free, you know, like the Tesla V100s. Like these are the, the ones that cost $10,000 each and only the supercomputer clusters have. Um, I don't know if that's the, the difference or if, you know, maybe you're just being a little impatient. Uh, that could be the case. You might, you might just need to wait a little bit longer because some of these things take on. But, uh, you know, with what you said about how it's training and the other things, maybe this doesn't make so much sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't tell you the answer because I also am not in charge of that part. Yeah, I, I kind of, okay, maybe I am in charge of the early stopper, but but it, I have to see exactly what you did and, and be able to reproduce it before I can fix this one for you. Mm -hmm. And you guys didn't try the hyperparameter optimizer yet because it doesn't really work with bring your own data. Why doesn't uh -huh. it? Just because I didn't implement it yet. Like you have to use one of the, the predefined data sets right now, but it just needs a little bit of work and then we can automatically optimize um, with, with your data sets too. So how did it work when, when you, you did get a model at the end that could output some scores. Did you actually try looking at them in the context of, of triples that you're extracting with Indra or 
you didn't quite get that far. Uh, yeah, so I did this with, um, I think in my earliest results with a senior data set, I, um, I trained on the whole senior data set and then I looked at uh, one, the, I just looked at one set of, of predictions for like, what does ERK phosphorylate? Link predict for ERK phosphorylate the blank. Mm -hmm. And then um, I took the top 20 of those tail predictions and then I looked them up in the inter database and eight of the 20 were um, either, were there either from another curated database or from machine reading. But then of course I need to take, let's say the bottom 20 and uh, you know, compare them to see like what the base rate is. But um, I was, I was, uh, and those are, sorry, and those are just the novel ones, obviously. Like I didn't look at any that were not novel um, because that meant that they were already in senior in the first place. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we updated that, that, um, oh, good. <laughs> that label. Now it says in training instead of novel, because I don't want to have to explain what novel means because that's only a, a product of like my opinions. It's, right, right, right. It will so be actually, training means. so is that is that on the latest PyPy release already? No, no, it's okay. It, it's it's in a done pull request. We just talked about it yesterday, and I don't remember if we decided we could just merge it or not. I, okay, me and Max were doing that one, and then uh, yeah, we're also adding another more complicated uh, evaluation metric set. Hmm. Why not? And, and so that was already implemented, but I'm forcing Max to write documentation for, for users on it before we merge it this time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's gonna, yeah, he's, he's working on it. Um, this nice. is interesting because you can, you can do head first evaluation or tail first evaluation, but usually you just combine them and take the average. And now we're gonna report all <laughs> separately. And so that will, that will give you insight into if your model is doing a bad job at certain kinds of like, um, relationships that are one to many or many to one mm -hmm. and for biological networks we're going to see all sorts of nonsense like that showing up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. obviously entities interact with all sorts of things so um yeah we want to make sure that there's an explanation of what's going on there before sending it to people mm -hmm. um, um the other i mean the other sort of big question and you i mentioned you mentioned this the other day was if i want to make a bunch of predictions and then say um get me the top strongest link predictions you have across entities and relation types that's not like a well-defined yeah um, well -defined. thing right because it's rank based right i mean this the the scores themselves are usually based on these ranking metrics right yeah. so yeah this isn't i mean and good let's talk about it again so anyone who's watching the recording knows what the issue is like mm. if if you have a given entity you can and, and relation, you can predict all the tails. Or if you have the relation and the tail, you can predict all the heads and you get scores for them. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not clear. And, and I think a lot of the times it's not well-defined if you compare different entities. Um, or so if you have a different head entity in the same relation and you get all the scores for all of the tails. And then you, have a di you start with a second different head entity and you get scores. It's, it's not clear if it's always the case that you can compare the scores of the results. Like which mm -hmm. triples are better overall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Biologically, of course, what we want to do is like take a network and make predictions for everything and rank and say, here, these are the things that would probably be the most useful to go test in the lab or to mm -hmm. ask the text mining database to, to look for, like if we were mm -hmm. thinking about prioritizing curation, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that's not an easy problem. And, and also... Yeah. The other, the other issue is that scores themselves are kind of weird uh, functions. And it, if you have a certain kind of model, like so you get an interaction function from rotate, and if mm -hmm. it's combined with a, um, a loss function, it may change the way that the score looks or the distribution mm -hmm. inside the score. So it's not necessarily, it's not obvious if you can just compare the scores from one model or another. And, and that's sort of an ongoing area of research the last time I was discussing with people who know more than I do. Um, you know, it would be nice if we had a, the right function for every combination of models and losses and, and that, that you can you know, put it past the scores through and then it normalizes it to a scale of zero to one, where one's, this should probably be an edge and zeros probably shouldn't be an edge. And that's what I'd really like to see. Yeah, I mean, because one of the things I would be interested in doing is using that score as a feature 
among other features associated with text mining to predict statement correctness, right? Is it kind of prior, um, you know, along with things like evidence count, like a kind of machine learned belief engine. This is something I was already looking at with things like, you know, sources and evidence counts and, and other features um, using simple logistic regression. But the, um, you know, you could imagine that like the, uh, this type of knowledge graph embedding based score could be very informative for cases where, you know, there's a lot of evidence, but it's some systematic error. There's a lot of sentences, but there's a systematic error and the entities have nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, but there the trick is if you're going to use it as a feature in your data set in, in, in like a learned model, you'd need to, uh, you'd want it to be sort of normalized in some way. And so I was thinking maybe there was a way to normalize it in some kind of percentile based um yeah approach or do some um uh what's what maybe i don't know i was just i don't know i've been trying to like brainstorm some different solutions to that kind of thing so so maybe we can take some inspiration not from the knowledge graph embedding model people but from the network representation learning people who who don't care about the relations so much um one of the things that they do pretty often is they generate embeddings for edges themselves um, to train, you know, binary classifiers for is this an edge or is it not an edge? Mm. It's a different way to go about it. And those kinds of classifiers are much easier to interpret because the, the model itself does tell you what it's likely to be one thing or another, yes or no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you could go and, and maybe if you want, uh, you take the entities and then you can create an edge embedding between a given set of two entities. Mm -hmm. And the most common way of doing this is what's called the Hadamard product, which is you have two vectors of the same length and you element wise multiply the, mm. them together and then you get another vector of the same length. And that would represent the edge between those two entities. It doesn't have a directionality, remember, um, because multiplication is, is uh, uh, yeah. commutative. commutative. Yeah. So, so this won't tell you everything but it might be a way to create a feature set to go with the given edge and mm -hmm. know that there should be an interaction at a very high level. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not just a single number, that's actually a rich feature vector. Mm -hmm. um, you could also do something like dimensionality reduction on one of those feature vectors to make sure it doesn't sort of dominate whatever downstream application you use. Because if the feature vector is like 50, long and then you have three other features that you think are really useful from other things, maybe they get dominated by the fact that there's so many. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hmm. Right. Unfortunately, I have to, I have to run um, something's come up, but I, I may try to, I'm going to do some more exploring and then I will, um, yeah. I will file some issues on PyKeen if these things are turn out to be real versus uh, like yeah, please do. not using things correctly. And if you send, if you send, you know, the, links to, I think if you're using Google Colab, it, it mm. saves the notebooks, right? But can you share them? With I think so. I don't know if they're public or, but maybe you can like permalink and like send, send them out. It would be interesting yeah. just to look at it. And then of course, when you get error messages, like you can copy paste those into the issues on GitHub. Yeah. And, and then you can also use that Python stack trace thing, which highlights it nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for, uh, for doing this and, you know, being available for this kind of stuff. It's really, uh, you know, sh steepening, uh, shortening the learning curve, at least for me. So uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Talk, to Talk to you later. Bye. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, maybe you, maybe you guys didn't know, but John and I have been working together for quite a long time. It's been a couple of years. So, so we tend to really get deep into chats very quick. So I, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize if uh, you guys wanted to get a word in, but didn't really get a chance. Um, you know, feel free to inter interrupt anytime. But yeah, was there anything else you guys were thinking about or wanted to talk about? Uh, so I have a question. So for like the link prediction task, do you usually, do you usually look for um, like at the end when you have a data frame saying whether things are not or not, are you, you are people usually only just interested in what's novel or kind of, you rank stuff by say scores and then you kind of try and look at what come up top and all the stuff that come up top are usually still interesting. Well, that's a good Even question. It, it depends on the task. In, in the biology world, you know, people are, are looking at 
what's novel or, or if they're starting to look at what's novel and, and hopefully they're going to the lab and doing experiments. But you know, you were, you're talking about this Amazon paper where they were doing some drug repositioning. I, I put this in quotes and um, they were just looking for the results showing up towards the top that were already in clinical trials because they wanted to say that they validated their methods. And I have lots of words to say about that. I think it's totally misleading. Um, because you know these clinical trials were also run based on the same assumptions and biases that ended up inside their knowledge graph that they learned from. So it's really hard to say that like you've been successful. You've only been able to recapitulate what's already known, which is fine. You should be able to do that. Like that's a sort of a sanity check when it comes to these methodologies. But it's not the the scientific part of it. That's more of the machine learning mindset, which is the problem with a lot of machine learning people getting into biology these days. Is, um, is the mindset of, you know, we just want to get good metrics, which is fine for like research purposes. But, you know, when it comes to the biology side, we want to do useful experiments and we want to, you know, improve the quality of people's lives by making medicine. That's the ultimate goal. And um, yeah, that, that kind of gets a little lost sometimes, I think. Sorry, so you would think about. so kind of, so you would still so kind of usually you would still be more interested in looking for novel stuff yeah rather than looking at this course and so the way the way it works in my company is you know I build the knowledge graph I train the models on it and I have it make predictions and I take the ones that are the most novel and they're ranked by novelty and you know we apply some other filters based on other rules that are you know this and that and then you know we say okay these are the experiments we want to run from from the most interesting predictions based on our our machine learning and then our other criteria and then we go to the lab and we test those predictions and then we see if we find new things and you know we got lucky already even though it's a young company and we found some chemicals that are active against our assays which represent certain disease indication and it's kind of it like once once you're getting that kind of results you're really doing what, what the company is, the drug discovery company set out to do. And you know, we, we want to bring that same mindset to Corona Y because we also are interested in identifying chemicals that might be useful to treat or, or cure the coronavirus uh, or the COVID-19 for the coronavirus. And um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can take those ideas and, and use them for, for this sort of thing. And, and of course, everyone has the chance to take those ideas and bring them back to their own use cases too. Yeah, so uh, how do you divide the data set into training and the test or the evaluation data set? Yeah, um, so, so is this, you, we want a technical answer or sort of a philosophical? No, not a technical answer. Uh, the way like uh, there might be chances like the same kind of relations or the entities will not be present in the training, though it is available in the test data set. So, yeah, okay. So, so that that is a definitely a mathematical problem. And so inside PyKeen, there's this split algorithm, which kind of, uh, it randomly will split the data set up based on your ratio. Mm -hmm. Usually, I think 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or 0.9 is a good ratio. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you end up with entities in the testing set that aren't present in the, the training set, you've got a big problem because those entities can't be learned. So what it does yeah. is the entities and the relationships in which they appear that are only in the testing set, and it moves them back over to the training set. And there's, there's kind of two different ways you can do that. The first is you can just take all of the triples that have entities that don't appear in the training set and move all of them. Or you can do it kind of in a stochastic way. You can pick them one at a time and then decide like, because it might be the case that a relationship, um, like the same entity could appear several times in the testing set, but never in the training set. And you might not have to move all the triples over from the, the testing set back to training. It might be good enough just to move one and if you do it in stochastic way, then you can sort of keep the, the balance a little bit better. Okay. Okay. So that's all kind of built into to PyKeen. Um, it wasn't before. This is something that I implemented like two weeks ago because we were trying to split up some data sets and it wasn't working. And so now that that pipeline is kind of implemented and in place, this is a little bit um, like it's a little bit easier on the user, I think. Um, yeah, this is great. Yeah. There's also another problem, which is really good to think about when you're talking about splitting up training and, and testing data, 
And that's the idea of inverse relationships. Now, depending on what kind of data set you have, you may have inverse relationships inside it. Like if you're using RDF, you may have a relationship like this protein binds to this protein, protein A binds to protein B, and then you may also have protein B binds to protein A. So that's a relationship that's kind of bi-directional. But then there's also directed relationships like um, protein A is a protein B, like there's some sort of hierarchy. But then you might also have uh, the reverse relationship, like protein B is super class of protein A. Like even though these are different relationships, they actually convey the same information. Mm. And uh, another problem that you can have in your, your splitting is that you end up um, kind of getting a, a cheat, you end up cheating a little bit if you have um, one of those triples in the training set and one in the testing set, because it, it's very easy to learn that two, trip, uh, two relationships are opposites, they're inverses of each other. And then it makes it very easy to make predictions on the opposite relationship. And this you know, inflates how good our evaluation metrics are. So there's this paper from, um, Taut, I think it's Tautsanova and Chen, uh, that they, they kind of outlined the algorithm for, for fixing this. We also implemented that. I called it the plumber. <laughs> I don't remember why it was called the plumber. It's something about, oh yeah, yeah. It's because they, in the paper, they called it um, testing leakage. And, and so most people will yeah. talk about testing leakage. And so I called it the, yeah. <laughs> the algorithm <laughs> the implementation of Pykeen is the plumber <laughs> because it fixes the leaks. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that's also um, something that, that you can op optionally apply. Um, it also has some, some tools for just identifying, you know, relationships that may be inverses of each other, because you should understand that kind of stuff about your knowledge graph before you're doing machine learning on it. So would you ever come into a situation where, say, you got, say you have a knowledge graph of, drugs and then you kind of got a new batch of stuff that you haven't really done much work on and you don't really know the relations then will you be able to do stem in the graph by seeing how like i don't know some sort of where what's their most similar drug or that's actually in the graph or will you have to find out their um relations to other stuff before you can use them yeah, that's, that's also an interesting question. It, it's pretty hard to do online learning of these graphs, especially when you need to add new entities because, um, yeah, they, they don't have any meaningful embedding yet. Um, there is this kind of generalized idea of imputation. So if you have a similarity metric, like drugs, you, you can actually make a similarity metric between chemicals based on their structures. And you can use that to kind of impute a... Um, an embedding and then add it to the model. I think this is a little tricky though. Um, this is definitely an area of ongoing research. It's actually something that I was considering working on and, and hopefully publishing in the future because no one's ever done that before. So yeah, maybe, maybe I'll end up doing that um, later this year. Uh, mm -hmm. In general though, you don't know similarities between things ad hoc. We, we get lucky with chemicals because of the idea of structural similarity. Um, Maybe it could also be the case with proteins, with sequences, but that's also a little more tricky. So, yeah, um, maybe maybe we can leave it there. I think uh, I'd, I'd like to see next week. I mean, I know I've been saying it before. Everyone's, everyone's doing their best to, to use a little bit of time to try this out, but I'd love to see some notebooks where people have actually um, got some code and um, hopefully they're not running into errors. And when you do, please, um, please submit issues onto this GitHub repository so we know what, what we need to fix. Sure. Uh, can you let me some, uh, can you let me know some data set on which I can try? Yeah, definitely check out this this um, this set of documentation because there's kind of a tutorial in the beginning. It starts you with some easy data sets, and then there's a couple notebooks that are talking about um, you know complicated biological data sets. So there's already like 13 ones built in. A couple of them are biological. A couple of them are are other things. Okay. 
and then you can try running on those and then you don't have to think about getting the data or importing it it's kind of already there for you okay yeah anything else guys nothing from my side not from me okay yeah well all right let's leave it at that it's it's friday we can all enjoy the evening the sun's still out in bond as you can see yeah, it's yeah. still in London as well. Great. Okay, well, guys, keep in touch this week. Um, you know, next week we'll go back to normal time on Thursday. Oh, that's good for everybody. Um, and then we can we can catch up then. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.